Uh, and the question we left with was, how do you give corrective feedback to a kid who's stuck? I don't know how to do this. What part don't you understand? All of it. So let's teach this kid the way our brains are built. That's a good way to succeed. So let me ask you some questions about how your brain is built. Have you ever had somebody give you directions to get to a restaurant on the other side of town? And when they're telling you how to get there, you're going, yes, you're following, okay, okay, okay. Then, an hour later, you go out to get in the car, and you're asking your, your spouse, now where are we supposed to turn? Now what was that street? Have you ever forgotten the directions within minutes, hours of having been given them? You ever had that experience? Well, welcome to your brain. That's how it works. We've known this for 10,000 years. So the saying is, in one ear, out the other. The kind of little secret uh, that we need to kind of bring into the light is this. We have almost no long-term memory in the auditory modality. We have almost no long-term memory in the auditory modality. In one ear, out the other. It comes and it goes as fast as it comes. Now, let me ask you this question. What is the primary modality of teaching that we use in every subject area, at every grade level, throughout our education system? What is our primary modality of instruction? Talk, talk, talk. You see the problem? We're constantly onloading information into the system in which there's no storage. So it comes in, it goes out. And when it's coming in, it creates something called cognitive overload, which is just the feeling of anxiety you get from too much stuff, I can't hold on to it, I'm, I'm forgetting it as fast as I'm getting it. And that's what kids feel when you talk to them for a minute, three minutes, five minutes, Think back to when you were in high school. How many of you remember sitting through a 25, 35 minute social studies lesson, a 25, 35 minute math lesson, yada, 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 yada. And by the time you got to the lesson, where was the stuff that was said 20 minutes ago? In, out. So I'm gonna draw a little picture here. Nah, I'm gonna forget that, we don't have time. Um, here is a, a little research goodie. How much can a typical human being keep straight, you know, remember clearly, for half a minute? How much talk can a typical human being remember accurately for half a minute? Well, if you want verbatim recall, the answer is two simple declarative sentences. But if getting the point is good enough, which is typically what we want in the classroom, you know, get, remember the gist of what I said, three sentences, four at the outside. Simple declarative sentences, not compound sentences, simple sentences, three or four, that's it. At that point, you start going into cognitive overload. It's going out as fast as it's coming in. Now, let's just apply that to things we've known for 10,000 years. All learning takes place one step at a time. Why does all learning take place one step at a time? Because that's all you can keep straight long enough to get to the second fundamental. We learn by doing. How do we take this input and lock it into our head so it doesn't just go out the other side? You learn by doing. So when you help a kid, what's your strategy? You ready? Because this is going to be simplification. Simplify, simplify, less said, less talk, less time. You have time when you help a child to answer one simple question. What do I do next? 
That's it. That's all you have time for, and the less said, the better. Two sentences will be better remembered than three. Three will be better remembered than four. So let me give you a kind of a generic uh, version of the speech pattern, because it's a very simple speech pattern. You have to kind of get past the verbosity that we grew up with and shave it down to something very simple. So let's say that you're doing a math problem and you're stuck on step seven. So it might sound like this. Okay, let's take a look here at step seven. On step seven, you do blah, 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 blah with those numbers. See my example up there? All right, do the rest of them up through step seven. I'll be come back in a minute, and we'll do step eight. Can you see how simple it is? One step. That's how you do it. Now, keep busy repeating it till I get back, and we'll get some memory. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Your enemy is yada, yada, yada. Your enemy is cognitive overload. Your enemy is in one ear, out the other. What is the natural tendency that we will all battle for the rest of our lives? Verbosity. The natural tendency to yada, 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 yada. And even when we try to be simple, teachers, as I've trained them and watched them in the classroom, they go, all right, the next thing to do is blah, blah, blah. For example, blah, 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 blah. Remember yesterday when we were doing blah, blah, blah? And I'm thinking, <laughs> shut up! <laughs> Just two sentences. Knock it off. They don't need to hear about yesterday and the example. What do I do next? Now, when you learn to cut the verbosity and cut to the chase, get to the point, how long does it take you to help the kid? Well, I've only scored that about 10,000 times. The answer is about 30 seconds. The range is maybe 15 seconds to a minute, but you'll average about 30 seconds. So how long does it take you to teach one step? If, you, if you're pretty good at it, 30 seconds. So we've gone from four and a half minutes of reinforcing learned helplessness to 30 seconds of pretty concise construction, instruction. Will that work? No, we're not there yet. Remember, how long does it take me to lose the class when I start talking to this kid? Answer, 10 seconds. So even though I've gone from four and a half minutes to 30 seconds, I'm still over time by 300%. Close, but no cigar, as the saying goes. So here I am looking at you know, it's an absolute dilemma of management. How can I give that kid all the help they can absorb, all the learning strategies they can use, in less than 10 seconds. Five seconds would be better. I was worrying about this, and I was in a fifth grade classroom when I had an epiphany, something the teacher said to the child. It just caused the lights to go on. The teacher was teaching long division, and so they'd gone through the routine of long division that you all learned years ago. Let's take a problem, six into 495. Class, can we take 6 into 4? No. Can we take 6 into 49? Yes. How many times, class? 8. After we divide, we multiply. 6 times 8 is 48. That's very good, class. After we multiply, we subtract. You've been through the whole routine. What do we do next, class? Bring down the 5. Can we take 6 into our new number? Yes. How many times? 2. Keep your column straight. 2 times 6 is 12. Blah, blah, blah. Remainder of, what do we call that? Remainder of 3. Okay. So the teacher's gone through this whole thing. This is up on the board. And I remember this from when I was in fifth grade. My teacher had a name for it. It wasn't a technical name. She called it my example on the board. As in, if you're having any difficulty, look at my example on the board and try to figure it out. Now, when I was a kid, it never re registered what the teacher was actually saying. It finally registered when I was in this class. And the teacher comes over to this kid who's struggling and says, I want you to look up there at step number four. So I looked up at step number four. Everybody, would you look up at step number four? Find step number four, would you please? Can you find step number four? I have a PhD, I'm looking up there and I can't find step number four. I'm thinking, you're asking this kid to find step number four? And then it dawned on me. 
The whole time I was growing up, I thought of this as a visual aid. You know, an aid to remembering, an aid to learning. And I never referred to it that much because I was a bright kid and I learned my math quickly and so, you know, I thought, well, some kids really need it. But I never thought about it that much until the teacher said, look at step number four, and I found, I can't see step number four, and then it dawned on me. That is not a visual aid. That is the destruction of the visual modality. Now remember, in one ear, out the other, versus a picture's worth a thousand words. If you destroy the picture, now what are you going to do? Yada, yada, yada? When you add step two, one's gone. When you add step three, one and two are gone. When you add step four, one through three are gone. When you add five, one through four are gone. When you add six, one through five are gone. So you may as well say to the class, all right, it's time for guided practice. As is our tradition, some of you will soar like eagles, the rest will sink like a stone. <laughs> the eagles will produce problems that look like my example on the board. For the rest of you, who knows? Okay, let's begin. They can't they can't help themselves by using that. So I thought, well, what's the alternative? Now, as I mentioned, I have a PhD in learning theory. It never, never helps me. So I got to thinking, well, what, what's the alternative? And the thing that came to mind is building a model airplane. Has anybody here ever built a model airplane? Gone to the hobby shop and bought? Well, OK, you open the box. What's on top of all the parts? The instructions. You take the instructions out, open them up. What does it look like? One step at a time, a picture for every step. Very little language because the, the company that makes the model airplane doesn't even know what country it's going to be sold in. They're not going to know the kid's age. They're not going to know the kid's IQ. They're not going to know the kid's reading ability. They're not going to know the kid's mother tongue. And if that thing doesn't go together right, the kid's never going to buy another one. So years ago, they figured out, cut the language, a picture's worth a thousand words. So let's try again. Eyes up here. Let's look at our first problem class, 6 into 495. Our first job class is compare. Zoom in so you can see this. Compare the 6 with the 4 class. And let's ask ourselves, class, can you take 6 into 4? Now, I'm going to have you do some signaling. Uh, Madeline Hunter talked about it. She had the kids do agree, disagree, you know, just to kind of keep them engaged. I was uh, teaching, or I was with, uh, in this uh, inner city school in Los Angeles, uh, junior high, and the teacher had the kids do this. Yes! No! Yes! No! I thought that was a little over the top, you know? I mean, these are junior high kids. They want to be cool, right? So I asked the teacher to break. Why are you having the kids go, yes, no? She said, wake them up. That's a great idea. So everybody, <laughs> you're going to do it too, all together. Yes, no, do it again. Yes, no, OK. Now, back to our problem. All right, class, eyes up here. Can we take six into four, class? No. All right, stop. Now let me point out a critical feature. Do you notice how closely this aligns with what I said? Nothing wasted. Let's take 6 into 495. Our first job is compare. Compare the 6 with the 4. Let's ask ourselves. See that? It's a perfect match. No wasted time, no wasted language. How did I do that? How are you going to do it? step by step, lesson by lesson for the rest of your life. How would you like to stay up until 12 o'clock rehearsing? Everybody. No, it's got to be a lot easier than that. Here, <laughs> here is what's going on. I have given up on the auditory modality. I've just given up on it. It's not that it's useless, it's just that out of a class of 30 kids, half of them won't remember what you said by this time tomorrow. So if they can't store it, what good is it? You're going to have to reteach it tomorrow. So my prompt is not what I say. I've written that off. My prompt is the picture, because a picture's worth a thousand words. And there's only one thing that's going to help every kid in the class learn, no matter you know, how well they heard what I said, and that's the picture. So. 
this is not a visual aid, an aid to remembering what I said. I'm not expecting you to remember what I said. This is a change in orientation. The prompt is the picture, the words are filler. Filler. You can teach almost as well if you're mute. Let's go on to the next step. Six into 495. Eyes up here, class. Six into four. Can we do that? No. Everybody with your hands. Can we do that? No. All right, let's come over here. Six into 49. Can we do that? Yes. How many times? How many times does this go into 49? Oh, you're sharp. So that means we can divide. It goes eight times. Next step. Six into four, 95. Eyes up here, class. Hands ready? Six into four. Can you do that? No. no. Six into 49. Can you do that? Yes. How many times? Eight. After we divide, we... Multiply. Eight times six is what, class? 40. Put it right here. On to the next step. Six into 495. Eyes up here. Let's rock and roll. Ready? Six into four. Can you? No. Everybody. Can you? No. Six into 49. Can you? Yes. How many times? Eight. After you divide you? Eight times six is? After you multiply you? Let's subtract, class. Nine take away eight is? Four take away four is? Stop. You get the picture? So what I'm constructing as I teach the lesson, I mean, you can do it at home before, but you can often do it just cold while you're teaching the lesson, is making a set of plans for the kid to use when they build what I want them to build. So it's just like a set of plans for a model airplane. What do you do first? What do you do second? There's a picture. What do you do third? There's a picture. What do you do fourth? There's a picture. So this is a kind of different approach to lesson plans. I'll ask most teachers, in college, did you have a course where you did lesson plans? And they'll say, yes. Did you outline the lesson? And they said, yes, we outlined, outlined, outlined. And then I'll say, how many of you still teach, or how many of you still plan every lesson, every day you go to work, the way they taught you to do it in college? And there's just laughter. And the reason is, you don't have time. You have uh, more important things to do. So let's just back off from our old habits and think in fresh terms about a lesson plan. A lesson plan is not for your substitute teacher, but they can use it if they want. A lesson plan is not for your principal, although they can use it if they want, or your supervisor. Rather, a lesson plan is for the student, and if it doesn't accelerate learning, it's not worth the paper it's written on. That is the most efficient way to accelerate learning I have ever found. If I were to fly all the way to the Philippines and give a five-minute workshop, that's what I'd show you, because that will accelerate learning more simply, cheaply, quickly than anything else you'll ever find. So you kind of give up these graphics that we grew up with and you do it in a different fashion. Now, the graphics that you use for different lessons look different. For example, for a social studies lesson, it might just be uh, an outline of a concept or even just a list. Um, I went to a public swimming pool uh, in our hometown when my kids were, were younger, and there was a uh, diagram of how to give artificial respiration in four pictures, no text and it was absolutely clear. How do you do it? A picture's worth a thousand words. So what this creates, several things, a visual display that's of the step that's permanent. Now that means while the kid is doing the assignment, they can look up at any moment to see what to do next. It's not in your head, and they have to pull you over here and have you explain it to them. It's out of your head now, and it's public knowledge. Now, what that does to a lot of the kids who are not terribly self-confident as learners 
is it reduces their anxiety. It reduces the fear that I can't do this, or I'm not going to be able to do this, or I can't remember what you said. You know, there's a lot of performance anxiety that the bottom half of the class accumulates in their years in the classroom. The bottom half of the class does not have a highly successful experience in the classroom. And so they have a lot of anxiety. And one of the reasons the kids are doing this is just to deal with their anxiety. You know, before I even try and fail, I want you to do it for me, and then I'll really know. So this is largely anxiety reduction. So what this ends up being is more than just an aid to learning. It ends up being the halfway house in weaning the child from their fear and dependency, from their tendency to say, Mommy, Daddy, would you come over here and do this for me? Which is infantile behavior, but they're still doing it. It weans them off of that fearful, infantile, dependent behavior from your body, Mommy, Daddy, show me how, to a body substitute. Think of this as a body substitute. This takes the place of your body coming over and spending 30 seconds explaining to the kid what to do next. Instead, it's instantly clear. Now, the question we started with is, how can I give that kid all the corrective feedback they can use in under 10 seconds? That's the only answer in town. To make it that brief, so I don't lose the class while I'm helping that kid, you have to pre-package it. It's that simple. You don't have time to explain it. You have to pre-package it. And you have to pre-package it in visual form so that it's instantaneously understandable. No deciphering, no explanation, no decoding, just as simple as the nose on your face. So the speech pattern, kind of the generic speech pattern, becomes even more simple. That's what I'm looking for, simple, simple, simple. It could sound like this. Okay, you're on seven, see step seven? Those two numbers right there. And you leave, because what you refer to is right up there. Not only that, we learned this as I taught the lesson. We've been through it several times together. So this isn't just something you're seeing from the first time. You're familiar with this because this is the lesson I just taught minutes ago. I'm pointing out the critical feature of one of the steps, and I'm out of here. Does this look like discipline management? Well, most people would say, no, it kind of looks like a lesson plan. No, this is discipline management. Remember what I said earlier? Prevention never looks like a discipline problem. By the time you have something that looks like a discipline problem, it's too late for prevention. You have a discipline problem. Prevention looks like everything else. It looks like working the crowd. It looks like arranging my furniture so I can get around. It looks like a lesson plan. If you want to prevent discipline problems, this is where you go. Now, there are other parts to prevention that uh, you know, are in the, in the book. And uh, you know, at this point, we usually you know, it gets, it starts to get a little complicated. We, ha we have to do some practice exercises. I think it's best if I just kind of stop right here with prevention so that you get a feeling for the nature of prevention and the, uh, the fact that we're really dealing with the instructional process so the next part of the um, instructional process that we deal with is, is the following. We started with the verbal, went from four and a half minutes to 30 seconds. We went to the visual, went from 30 seconds to five seconds. Next is the physical. You learn by doing. How do you learn by doing with a social studies lesson? How do you do a concept? All kinds of things like this percolate to the surface when you just look at the instructional process. But let's stop that make a change in direction, let me check my time, and look at remediation. So we're still in discipline management, we're still in classroom management, but no matter how good you are at prevention, certain misbehaviors will still occur. You know, prevention is never perfect. So uh, let's take a discipline problem. And let's, uh, let me have the two of you 
be my target. Now, I'm not going to have you role play. I just, you know, uh, you're just in a convenient location, so just sit there. Let's say that I'm helping this student when I look over and see the two of them fooling around in the middle of class, right when they're supposed to be working. You know, they're poking each other, they're laughing, you know, they're talking to the person behind them. Now let me ask you a question. When you look up and you see two kids doing the exact opposite of what they're supposed to do, does it bug you? Be honest. Does it bug you? Yeah, of course it bugs you. You're trying to teach a lesson, you put all this work into the lesson, and they're killing it. So the most natural thing for, for, for you to do is to feel some upset. Maybe not rage, but it bugs you. Let me talk about stress management. Would anybody here um, dispute the fact that teaching is a stressful op occupation? <laughs> Let me say something about stress management. In order to succeed with stress management, you have to do it moment by moment, class period by class period, on the job, in the classroom. You can't do it later. You can't do it after you go home. You can try. You can jog, try and get rid of some of that nervous energy. You can uh, meditate. You can have a glass of Chardonnay. Whatever you try, it's only damage control. The damage has already been done. You've already suffered seven hours of stress in the classroom. If you're going to manage stress, you have to manage it moment by moment in the classroom. So far, so good? So every time some kid gets out of line and I look up, I feel stress because it bugs me. Every kid that's fooling around is a stressor. Now, let's talk about stress analytically because it's your body and it's your body that you're going to have to learn to manage if you don't want to be stressed. That feeling of mild upset, that being bugged, what you just experienced was a reflex which you studied in your first high school general science class. It was called a fight-flight reflex. Does everybody remember the fight-flight reflex, the startle response from your high school science class? Well, that's what you just had. It's that basic universal reaction to threat or surprise, it could be a sudden clap of thunder that startles you, or it could be a spider on your shirt that startles you, or it could be a provocation from another person. Any of those things will trigger the fight-flight reflex. Stress management is nothing but the management of the fight-flight reflex. So if you want to manage stress in your body, day after day on the job, you must understand the fight-flight reflex. I'm going to go fast forward here. There are two parts to it. One, skeletal muscular. Muscles flex. So, you're on alert. So, everything flexes. So, eyes wide open, teeth together. That's one of the first symptoms of, of the fight-flight reflex. Teeth together. And then everything flexes. These muscles flex. Your viscera flex, which shoots up your blood pressure. So your muscles tense, your blood pressure goes up. But here's another thing that's um, part of the fight flight reflex. In a social situation, your mouth comes open. And when your mouth comes open, it tends to sound like this. Would the two of you please turn around in your seats and get some work done? I'm tired of looking over there and seeing nothing but talk. Oh, there it was again. Nag, nag, nag. So let me give you a biological definition of nagging. Because nagging is natural biological behavior. If you have a friend who says, I never nag my children, you have a liar for a friend. <laughs> we all do it. Some do it more than others. Nagging is nothing more than a fight-flight reflex with your mouth open. But we don't just speak with our mouth. We speak with our hands as well. So sometimes, since this is a primitive reflex, you don't know you're doing it until you look up and see your hands. Now here's how it works. Flex your bicep, your hand comes up. So here are some of the more common, well, we call them flapping. 
flapping, it's pheasant posturing, or squawking and flapping. Here are some of the more common classroom flaps that teachers use. First, the circular flap. Would you turn around in your chair and... Have you ever done that one? It's kind of like it has a, a mind of its own out at the end of your arm. Then there's the vertical flap. Would you sit in your seat? Have you ever done that one? Now, when both hands get involved, we're, we're, we're really getting ready to take off. We're really flapping hard. All right, class, it's altogether too noisy in here. Now, the longer it takes this class to settle down, the longer my arms will be up, I guess. <laughs> so we have three names for it now. Fight, flight, reflex, nag, 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 peasant posturing. I was working with the faculty at the court schools in the city of Los Angeles. Can you imagine the student body of the court schools of Los Angeles? The nicest kid in class is a felon. So this is a teacher in the court schools. She says, oh, I have another name for that, Dr. Jones. I said, yeah, what is it? She said, I call it snap and snarl. This is what I do. Would you sit down? Would you keep your hands to yourself? See, I keep doing this. I can't stop myself. Would you? <laughs> and we're laughing because you're in front of a group of felons and you think that's going to change things? <laughs> we do funny things. But by far the most insidious part of the fight flight reflex is the second part, biochemical. The chemical is adrenaline. Now, here's some things you need to know about adrenaline. When you have a fight flight reflex, your body dumps adrenaline into your blood system. Here's what it does. It increases metabolism. It burns sugar fast. That gives you energy fast. Second thing, it takes 27 minutes to clear the bloodstream. Translation, it takes two squirrely behaviors per class period to keep you chemically wired for the rest of your career. <laughs> You're always, oh, does this sound sensible? on your toes. Does it make sense to, to run a classroom? You have to be on your toes. You never know what's going to happen next, right? Wrong. You don't want to live that way. Because if you're on your toes, dealing with this and dealing with that, you're always is, is secreting adrenaline into your blood, which gives you an energy boost. So all day long, you have that energy boost that comes from adrenaline. Isn't that wonderful? Not really because what you're doing is running up an energy debt, just like a long distance runner runs up an energy debt. How long will it take you after the kids leave to feel the price you've paid? How about 27 minutes? You're still on the chemical. So after the kids leave, you're busy. You're getting this thing ready for tomorrow, this handout, this project. You're still scurrying around. But about a half, half an hour after the kids leave, it hits you. Oh, I gotta sit down. <laughs> oh. <sighs> what a day. <laughs> you ever have that feeling about a half an hour after the kids leave? Yeah. What a day. This is payback time. <laughs> you now get to pay back the energy debt. How long will it take you to pay it back? about as long as it took you to create it, seven hours. That's why teachers take Salmonex to fall asleep. That's why they wear bite plates so they don't grind their teeth at night. But basically, you go home tired. The tank's empty because you gave it away to everybody else's kids. And you go home, and your wife says, honey, I need to talk to you about something. And you say, do we have to talk about it right now? <laughs> and your kid comes up to you and says, daddy, I just broke this. And you say, you broke it already? We just gave it to you last week. Hey, aren't I doing a great job as a husband and a father? Let me tell you something. I don't know what your pay package is, but nobody's paying you enough for your physical well-being or your marriage or your kids. There has to be an easier way to do this job. Which brings us to meaning business. How do you mean business? Let me give you a little advanced organizer here. Uh, you guys will still be my target. I am helping a good little student here, little Robert. When I catch them fooling around, and I see they're fooling around, I'm going to have to deal with it. 
Now, does this make sense? If I'm going to deal with it, the first thing I have to do is just turn toward the kid before I even say anything. I mean, kind of a no-brainer, but I just want to check with you. Does that sound logical? Turn toward the kid to deal with it? I got news for you. It's a fast game. By the time you turn to the kids, the game's over. So I'm going to turn two times. And you're just going to watch because one of the things we learned about meaning business is it's 95% body language. The kids read you like a book. By the time the substitute teacher has introduced themselves to the class, the kids know what they can get away with today. It's that fast. So I'm going to turn to you two times. You're just going to watch. You're going to read body language the way you did when you were two years old, and then you're going to vote. Which turn means business more? Now, the first part is a constant, so it's irrelevant. I'm helping little Robert. I see the problem. I excuse myself from Robert. Up to that point, both turns are identical. After that point, they're different. Watch the turns, then you vote. Ready? Turn number one. Turn number two. Excuse me, Robert. Stop. Which means business? How many for turn number one? How many for turn number two? Well, put a hand up if you're going to think. <laughs> Thank you. So what does that prove? proves the whole human race reads body language. And you could tell the difference between meaning business and not meaning business by the time I turn to that child. Well, there's no place to hide in the classroom if everybody's reading what you're doing that accurately. What's the difference between meaning business and not meaning business when I turn toward that child? I'll count it for you. Turn number one. Excuse me, Robert. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Turn number two. Excuse me, Robert. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006. What's the difference between meaning business and not meaning business when I turn toward that child? Three seconds. Why? Because upset is quick and calm is slow. And the kids can read how upset you are by the speed of your turn. Which brings us to the first, most basic principle of meaning business. In conveying power, we're talking about power, a word that we tend to be a little uncomfortable with, particularly when talking about our relationships with children and other people. But the, uh, the issue is power. When conveying power from my body to your body, from your body to anybody's body, kids, colleagues, spouse, Calm is strength. Upset is weakness. Calm is strength, but it is not natural. It is learned. Upset is weakness, but it is natural. It's a fight-flight reflex. What could be more natural than that? So the first thing we learn is we're kind of programmed backwards. We're programmed for life in the wild, biologically. That's where we spent most of our history. We're not programmed for civilization. Civilization is acquired slowly, as you all know, from raising children in the classroom. Calm is strength. Let me fast forward the learning curve. 
you're in a situation in which you are being provoked. Now, you can imagine any situation you want. It could be a surly wait person in your restaurant. It could be, you know, a, a friend who's giving you a hard time or a non-friend who's giving you a hard time. You are being provoked. If in this moment I am upset, who is in control of my mind and body right now? Tell me, who? The other person. I am in a situation in which I am being provoked. If at this moment I am calm, who is in control of my mind and body right now? Who? I am. Do not imagine that you be, can be in control of another person's behavior, much less the behavior of an entire classroom, until you are first in control of yourself. One of the hardest lessons for green teachers to learn is that discipline management, when you're dealing with remediation, is first and foremost emotional. And emotions happen fast, and adrenaline enters the bloodstream quickly, and when that happens, it's probably too late. It's over quickly. Calm is strength. Upset is weakness. Some teachers are naturally calm in the face of threat. Once again, choose your parents very carefully because that's probably where it comes from. Now let me just model for you for a second. Let me check my time again here because I don't want to make you late for lunch. <laughs> You're almost late for lunch. Well, anyway, let me uh, model for you my fifth grade teacher, Miss Haynes. Now I'll tell you why I picked on you guys just to be a target. There was a kid in my class named Larry, and he was always in trouble. So whenever I think of Larry, I think of a kid giving a teacher a hard time. In my fifth grade class, Larry sat right there. So this is all very autobiographical. Anyway, Miss Haynes was a natural, if there ever was one. A young teacher, vivacious, pretty, but nobody's fool. Now, she had had a run-in or two or three, with Larry early in the school year. And Larry learned some things from Miss Haynes. Number one, you're going to lose. Number two, don't try me. Miss Haynes was not to be toyed with. But she was always mild, always kind. But she did not turn a blind eye to any foolishness. And once it started, you would deal with her until it stopped, period. So anyway, Miss Haynes was explaining something to the class, a very vivacious woman, and out of the corner of her eye, she caught Larry turning around and poking the kid behind her. And in the middle of a sentence, Miss... And Larry went... Miss Haynes said, as I was saying, class, right back into it. She nailed Larry in the middle of a syllable. Why? Because she had an absolutely clear understanding of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And once I saw, even out of the corner of my eye, something that was not acceptable, that suddenly became the most important thing going on in my class. And her body language said, this lesson is not going one inch forward until that behavior stops. And Larry had learned from experience that if he didn't want to shape up here, she would come around very slowly. And if he didn't want to shape up here, she would move over there very slowly. <laughs> but the bottom line was fixed. You will lose. The only variable is how much you want to lose. Kind of like a poker game. Don't throw good money after bad. If you're going to lose, throw in your cards. The kids learn, don't gamble against Miss Haynes. She says what she means. She means what she says. She's nobody fool, and she's not blind either. One of the additional attributes of uh, meaning business is consistency. But now that's just a word, easy to say, consistency, consistency. When I was 
the University of Rochester, I was teaching graduate students to do family therapy, and we had a clinic, an outpatient clinic, and we all, the faculty saw some patients, you know, after work just to keep our clinical skills up. And it was an outpatient clinic. We weren't dealing with crazy people. We were dealing with families who were coming into a family clinic with problems. Now, here's a typical problem. Father 37, mother 35, one child, three years old. Who do you think is running the entire household? The three-year-old. They come in, we're at our wit's end. We just don't know what to do. So we're trying to teach the parents parenting skills. And once again, they're similar to classroom management skills. And one of the things is to clarify what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Then mean business when the kid does something that's not acceptable. And be consistent, blah, blah, blah. Now, we had a pretty good track record because we're, you know, good at what we did. We, we practiced, we taught, you know. But there are two families that I will never forget as long as I live that tried my patience to the point where I was having a fight-flight reflex in spite, of, in spite of myself. We would practice, no means no. This is how you stand, this is what you do, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine, good. We practice it, okay. See you next week. They come in next week. How'd it go? And this is what I would get. Well, not so well, Dr. Jones. Have you ever had a parent conference with somebody like this? <laughs> I can't get them to do anything. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, I know what you said, Dr. Jones, but we were in the supermarket, and he started pulling down the cans of green beans, and I tried to stack them up as quickly as I could, but then they all came down, and it was, it was awful. Now, I want to assure you that I was kindly, I was a health giver, after all, a clinical psychologist. So I'm paraphrasing. But what I said, in effect, was, no! If I wanted you to stack green beans, we'd have practiced stacking green beans. What we practiced was saying no, meaning no. If you think you can raise a child without unceremoniously picking them up in the middle of a supermarket at least once and saying, we're leaving, where is the last place this kid will act like a horse's rear end after you think they're civilized at home? out in public, at church, at grandmothers, in the supermarket where they think you'll pull your punches because you don't want to look bad in front of other people. So you think they're civilized, where will they test you? In public. You have to teach that kid the same rules apply everywhere. I don't care if it's in church. That will not be accepted. You're going home. Oh, okay. All right, let's practice some more. Practice, practice, practice. See you next week. Come in the next week. How did it go? Well, <laughs> not so well, Dr. Jones. It's starting to hurt my pride, you know. So what happened? Well, I know what you said, but we were in a restaurant, and we'd ordered a hot meal, and they were about to deliver, you know, serve it to our table. So when he started throwing the hard rolls, we couldn't just leave, could we? I mean, we were going to have to pay for the meal. I want you to know that I was a kind person and gentle, but what I said was, where is the last place the kid will act like a horse's rear end? Out in public. Can you allow them to act that way? No. You will say to them, box the meal, we're taking it home. You'll pick the little twerp up, take them home, maybe give them cold cereal before you send them to bed, and then sit down and maybe reheat and eat your dinner. You have to teach the child the same rules apply out there as apply in here. Don't try me out there. You're going to get the same response you get at home. Oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> All right, let's try some more. Practice, 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 practice. See you next week. Come in next week. How'd it go? Well, not so well. You see what I'm up against here? This is driving me to distraction. What happened? Oh, well, I know what you said, Dr. Jones, but it was his birthday party, and children brought presents, and it was time for the ice cream and cake. And so when he started running around and hitting the other children, we couldn't just stop the party, could we? I mean, they brought presents, and they hadn't had their cake yet.
Well, after the people go home, the clinical faculty talk about their patients. You might think this is a high-level discussion between PhDs in clinical psychology. Not really. Our name for parents like this is weenies. Weenie parents. Have you ever had a weenie is a kind of a slang term in America, which means somebody with no backbone. <laughs> okay. These are weenie parents, no backbone. <laughs> so I said to one of my colleagues, you won't believe that one of, what one of my weenie parents said today. He said, well, what did they say? They said, well, Dr. Jones, I really think we are pretty consistent. My buddy's cracked up. But you didn't. You didn't see anything funny? Well, let me tell you what the other weenie parents said, because they were in worse than this one. They said, but Dr. Jones, we are consistent most of the time. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. The point is this. Consistency is one of those strange words in the English language that does not permit degrees. It's like the word dead. <laughs> There's no such thing as semi-dead. You're here or you're gone. <laughs> There's no such thing as pretty dead. <laughs> oh, is he alive or is he dead? Well, he's pretty dead. No, well, well, which is it? Consistency is one of those words. There is no such thing as very consistent, pretty consistent, extremely consistent. Those are jokes to people who understand consistency. There are only two conditions, consistent or inconsistent. That's it. There isn't any more. Now, my mother was consistent, much to my benefit. No meant no. How many have times have you heard people say that? Well, she was an old third grade teacher, and when she said it, she meant it. And as a kid, I learned no means no, period. Now, We've all had developmental psych. We all know that kids push boundaries. And if the boundary is stable so that it never moves, the kid learns to live within the boundary. They quit testing. They relax because they know where the boundaries are. But if the boundaries keep moving, the kid gets anxious and keeps testing just to see where they are today. You all remember this from developmental psych? OK. That's what consistency is about. I learned at a very early age, this is permissible and that isn't. And I learned to live within the boundaries. And as a result, I had a very relaxed childhood. I was not at war with my parents when I was 8 or 10 or 12 or 15. We had a very, very relaxed, positive relationship. But my parents were playing the parent role. They weren't expecting me to by setting my own limits. The weenie parents. They make a deadly error. Let's say my mom, who was, if, if she said no, she meant it five out of five times. You know, take it to the bank. No means no. What if my mom, instead of being consistent, had been pretty consistent? No means no four out of five times. That's a pretty good batting average, isn't it? No, it's terrible. Here's what happens. The kid pushes against the boundary, and you say no. Push again, number two. No, three, no, four, no, five, and it moves. And I get my way, and I think, oh, no kidding. So my whole relationship with my mom would have turned on its head, and instead of no meaning no, no now means try me. See if today's your lucky day. It could be, but you won't know if you don't try. <laughs> so for you more technically minded, my mother, through her error, would have put me on a one to five schedule of reinforcement for, to use my mother's word, yammering. Why can't I? Why can't I? It isn't fair. That's called yammering in my mother's lexicon. But 
life is random. So I would have been on a random intermittent one to five schedule for you more technically minded, which means this, sometimes you win on number two, sometimes you win on number eight, sometimes you win on number four, sometimes you win on number 10, but it averages five. That means I can lose eight in a row. And what does that mean to the child? It means I'm about ready to win. Because I've gone nine and one. I've gone 10 and one. It's time to get serious and bear down. That's when the kids, oh, and this is another clinical term, turns into a real brat. Now, let's look at more consistent. What if my mother had been more consistent? What if instead of cracking, no, that's the word we use, cracking one out of five times, she only cracked one out of 10 times? Is that better or worse? It's worse because that kid has gone nine times, 15 times, 18 times, and then won. So if they lose nine in a row, it doesn't mean give it up. It means you're just getting into the real game here. You're just getting warm. Yeah, you're done with your want. It's time to bear down. It's time to, time to win now. So the closer you come to being perfect without being perfect, the worse it is. Or as you learn in your first behavioral course in college, the leaner the schedule of reinforcement, the more resistant to extinction. If you put a kid on a 1 to 20 schedule for yammering, the kid will be a brat forever because they never give up. They keep thinking they're going to win because they won before. Can you see how uh, the concept of consistency is at the heart of meaning business? But I have rarely run across a new teacher who understood consistency. When you deal with a teacher who's been in the classroom 10, 15 years, or maybe raised a couple of kids, they understand consistency because they made all the mistakes themselves when their kids were little, and they're older and wiser now. But you take some 22-year-old, 23-year-old out of college who hasn't raised a family yet, and you talk about consistency, say what you mean, mean what you say, every time, no variance, and they look at you like, oh, come on, lighten up. These are children, dude. Lighten up. Quit being so rigid. It has nothing to do with rigid. It has nothing to do with my personality. It has to do with schedules of reinforcement, and you can look at the curves in any learning textbook and know exactly what you're up against. So what is meaning business? Calm. Commitment. Consistency, the three C's, calm, commitment, which means you will follow through as far as you have to, consistency, 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 and there is no such thing as very consistent, extremely consistent. They don't exist. You are or you aren't. And one of the footnotes of this is choose your rules very carefully because every time you make a rule in the classroom, it has this big price tag hanging on it and it says you're going to pay for that rule every time you look up and see a kid breaking it. So if you don't want to stop your lesson and deal with it, don't make the rule. So the first rule of rules is don't make a rule that won't be worth your time anytime, anywhere, period. A lot of green teachers, young teachers, make classroom rules like a wish list. This is, this is the kind of behavior I'd like to have. And it sounds like, you know, the ideal human being. They almost walk on water. You know, if the kids could follow all these classroom rules, they would be saints. This is the real world. You're dealing with a bunch of kids. What rules are you willing to go to bat for and what rules aren't worth your time? Never make a rule that's not worth your time. Well, today we've had a chance to look oops, at discipline management, at least in part, a small part. We've had a chance to look at prevention in very specific terms. We've looked at working the crowd, room arrangement, the auditory modality, prompt leave, the visual modality, visual instructional plans, the pictures. We've looked at remediation, meaning business, calm is strength, upset is weakness, We've looked at how natural upset is, how much we have to practice 
in order to calm down, slow down. And finally, at the end, we've learned that consistency is not just a term you throw around. It's either live by it or die by it. Well, that's enough for one morning. I want to thank you for having been such a good, responsive, pleasant audience. We are done. Time for lunch. Thank you. Thank you.